Welcome to the Flippin' Health Podcast, where we turn medicine on its head, flip it upside down, shake it all about, and see what comes out. We're going to challenge convention and change medicine for the better. Hello, I'm Grant Schofield. And I'm George Henderson. Welcome to the Flippin' Health Podcast. And we're here with Libby Jenkinson today. Libby, tell us about yourself. Um, I'm Libby Jenkinson, and I'm the founder of Ditch the Carbs, pharmacist and mother of three. So what is Ditch the Carbs? Um, Ditch the Carbs is a predominantly a recipe website, and I've also got articles, videos, um, tips, practical advice how to actually start low carb, and why it's so advantageous. And so that's really your full-time mission now is working on Ditch the Carbs? Yep, absolutely. I used to be, I'm still a registered pharmacist, but no longer a practicing pharmacist. So um, I ran Ditch the Carbs for a few years before starting, um, while I was still working, and um, now I've resigned from my role as a pharmacist and now completely, yeah, dedicate all my time to Ditch the Carbs and helping people through low-carb nutrition. And, uh, and it's it's pretty big now, right? Can you give us some number, give us some numbers? Just because the mind oh boggles when you hear some this. Some numbers. Um, I added up social media the other day. Social media alone on all my platforms added up has just gone over the million mark now. Wow. And um, page views, I think I get roughly two to two and a half million page views a month. Wow. And um, a million visitors. So and I've got something like I don't know eighty five thousand subscribers. So it's 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 kind of getting up there. <laughs> and so the mind boggles is that. You you were doing your pharmacy stuff and you yep. became interested. Just up the road. <laughs> and you became interested in nutrition. How? Um, well, it was through you and through Karen, and I attended some seminars up at AUT about low carb nutrition and sort of you know the state of the world of nutrition. And um, it was just fascinating the effect. You know, you discussed everything through how low carb works, what is wrong with a standard American kind of diet that we're all on now. And, you know, you talked a lot about insulin resistance and metabolics and all these kind of light bulbs were going off. And then I started to look at, you know, patients that were coming in and thinking, you know, it involved in so many areas, these modern diseases with our nutrition and how we're currently eating this high carb diet that we're all supposed to be on. And so you started eating that way yourself. Yeah, yeah. Your family was... Your kids were even younger than they are now then? Yeah. When, so as soon as I started, I knew immediately that I wanted our family eventually to become low carb. And we kind of did it, you know, and I was teaching, you know, the people who are in my groups, I always go stepwise, you know, we kind of did the odd meal low carb and then I slowly transitioned us, you know, onto low carb and the children took a little bit longer and, um, you know, they, they were kicking and screaming a few steps of the way, <laughs> but they, they enjoy it and um, they eat such amazing nourishing foods now compared to, you know, the food that they were on. So, yeah, it's, it, it takes a while, but you get there. But how, how does one go from being a practicing pharmacist, to then running uh, a, an operation of the scale of Ditch the Carbs? It kind of happened by accident, really. I literally started Ditch the Carbs as a hobby, and it was something to kind of keep me accountable and to kind of have this almost hobby about low-carb um, baking, low-carb meals, everything like that. And then I remember the sort of my light bulb moment is when I went to Low Carb Down Under. Do you remember that back in, I think it was 2014 possibly, when they held it here in Auckland? Yep. And the day was phenomenal with all these worldwide experts in whether it was low carb nutrition or some other kind of aspect. And it was fascinating and all the science is there. But what I loved is everyone stood on the stage, all the experts, and they all had to say what they ate, what their kind of general day looked like. And that was what the whole audience was like hanging on every single word and I thought well as much as the science is out there it's the practice it's the practice that's right and how is it going to help public health unless people know as a family okay well what on earth do I feed my kids or what on earth do I make for dinner if I'm not going to have pasta and bread and potatoes anymore you know practically how does that get applied to everybody so do you pinch yourself do you look at it and just go (laughs) whoa well, it, it is bizarre to think that, you know, five years, I didn't even know, literally, I didn't even know what a hashtag was. And I remember asking a friend of mine, going, what's a hashtag? How do you use them? And I had no idea. But you know what? If you've got an absolute love for something, and it's like with anything in life, you start looking into it, you look into every area, and you slowly improve. Like, I, all my photos 
and they still are of, of our family dinners, but I literally took them on my iPad, and that was it. And then they're still our family dinners. They've just become a bit more professional how I take them. And so I kind of did it, you know, yet again, stepwise and gradually. I kind of started off this website and thought, you know, people are actually finding this useful and helpful, and I'm getting feedback. And um, so, yeah, it's just slowly, gradually taken on a, almost like a life of its own. But, yeah, I, I do struggle sometimes thinking, crikey, I've um, got this beast that I sometimes don't know what to do with. <laughs> Well, I'd just like to congratulate you on what you've done. I just oh, think it's you. astonishing yeah, it's and what you've been able to achieve and the the material that's up there and, and uh, yeah, almost all of it is just free. Yeah, yeah, exactly So right. people, it's just a ma- massive resource, isn't it? And, and that's what I want to do. I don't want anyone, and I, mean, I do have paid courses and paid memberships now if people want that, but the majority, I want it to be free for all you know, there's there's free books, there's free e-books, there's free articles, everything. So, because I mean, they're the people who need it the most. The people who can't afford programs or books or whatever, they're the ones who just want to come into the free group and go. You know what? What do I do? And that's the ones that I want to help the most. Right. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna take you through our standard <laughs> set of of questions, and I think you'll have some particular perspectives on this yep. because of your health professional background and. So just thinking about the health system in this country and around the mm-hmm. world, what's good about it? Um, I think we've got a fairly comprehensive healthcare system. You know, we've got primary, secondary, tertiary care. It's all predominantly funded by the government. Yes, you can have private if you want to go, you know, better facilities or faster, but it is predominantly funded by the government um, compared to other countries that aren't. Um, so I think that's what's good about it. I think, um, you know, all of the medical professionals absolutely turn up to work to do the best they can. No one turns up to sort of, you know, be miserable to their patients or, you know, everyone's <laughs> trying their hardest. So I think we have a good healthcare system. And so what's not working in it? I think we actually, instead of having a healthcare system, I think we've got a sick care system. I think more should be done into preventative, to lifestyle medication, not medication, um, lifestyle interventions, and helping patients to help themselves. You know, that's the biggest thing, is that give patients the options that, you know, surgery and drugs isn't the only option. There is a third option. But then the poor GPs haven't got the time. You know, when they've got a seven-minute window to literally go and see their patient, and they know they've got ten more out in the waiting room, there needs to be this kind of help gap that needs to be filled where health coaches you know exactly could come in or something but there is this gap between what patients you know would like to have this extra advice and given the options which currently aren't being given so george and we talked about that earlier shop around you're offered a medication Mm. that could offer these benefits but but if you shop around you may find that the medication is just affecting some pathway that Mm. would be affected by you know diet or fasting or exercise or, or something like this in- increasingly, the most, the most popular new medications all seem to work on pathways that uh, we know as ketogenic diet pathways to do with blocking effects of insulin or blocking effects of glucose. Mm. You yeah, know, absolutely. And shopping around, not only for that, but also like a medical professional that you actually like and trust and get on with and knows yes. what your goals are in life rather than just this is the medication we want to give you and, you know, the the um, the GPs in charge. The patient's also got to be their own advocate and fight for their own... At the end of the day, it's all up. The patient has got to decide as well. So I'm not really anti-medicine, but I'm no. anti this idea of interfering at just one step of of the homeostasis of the body mm. uh, when when it's you're going to get some side effects. Yeah, exactly. And are those side effects worth the medication that you're taking? And for some people, that's yes. And for some people in some situations, that's no. But to be given that sort of deeper understanding when you're in the GP surgery. But again, it's hard when GPs have got literally seven minutes. So it, but when you're practising pharmacy, are you communi- how do you communicate that as well? Because if someone's taking a medication, it, there's, there's always a chance of benefit mm. and there's always a chance of some harm. And how do you help people weigh that up? It's really difficult because, again, there's that ethical and decision between you cannot... Um, sort of counter-argue what another health professional has said to that patient because you don't know the full medical situation. So I can't say to somebody, actually, I don't think you should be on that medication because I don't know the full history and the full background. And what the patient may tell you is completely different to what the situation is and all that kind of thing. But if people come and ask me, say, for example, should I be on this medication, and they've clearly asked for advice then I think it's unethical of me not to offer, say, low carbers if that is a solution in that, in that example. 
So I think, you know, when people say you can't offer low carb as a, as, um, a treatment advice, well, I think it's unethical not to. So have you found yourself, uh, when you've been in the pharmacy, offering that advice? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I have to, when I was working, I couldn't say what I did that I ran this website. Other people could, but unethically it would look like I was promoting myself. So I would just say, you know, do you realise that there is an alternative route you can go? Do you realise this is what you could do? For an, and a classic example is one woman came in for her daughter and she went to the hospital dietitian. Her daughter had, uh, um, is a celiac. She was given boxes, literally boxes we had to collect, take them to the car of gluten-free pasta, spaghetti, you oh name it, of the bread, the bread mixes, Honestly, there would have been maybe twenty boxes in the dispensary. And anyway, so and I that's said, a prescription medication. Yeah, absolutely d- prescribed by the hospital dietitian up here. And right, so they, went, don't, they can't prescribe you a good steak. Yeah. So I went up to her and I said, "Oh, you know, I've seen you've got all these." I said, "You know, you're clearly gluten free." She goes, "Oh, yeah, that's my daughter." And I said, "Oh, have you ever heard of zoodles?" And so I just explained to her politely. You know, and she goes, oh, no, what are those? So I explained that instead of having gluten-free pasta, would she maybe just consider making some zoodles? So zoodles are zucchini noodles. So, you know, you get your little grater and you, and you make your, your zoodles, or you can do it with carrot, with lots of different vegetables. And she goes, oh, I've never heard of that. And she was flabbergasted. And she goes, my daughter, who the prescription was for, loves vegetables. Why was I never given this as an option? So it was, you know, maybe she, if she, the dietitian had time, she could have given her the option of going, well, look, okay, there is this easy alternative, this whole food alternative. You can make zoodles or you can do other kind of things. Or you can have your dinner on top of coleslaw. Or, you know, there's a hundred different things you could do instead of gluten-free pasta, which is so ultra-processed and so expensive and nutrient-devoid. So in that... And, as, and just disgusting in the absolutely, mouth. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And she goes, she's hate this, this bread, you know, she was complaining about it. And I said, well, there are these other options. Um, so I explained to her, I said, look, you need to go and do your own research as to what's available, but this is an alternative. And it, for her, it was like, oh, my word, and why has no one told me this? As she's lugging all these boxes into her car. So that's just a classic example, whereas I wasn't contravening what the dietitian had said. I was just giving an alternative because I think it was, you know, unethical, immoral of me not to say you're, to that you're woman... You're not telling it to eat, quotient. No, exactly, yeah. exactly. I'm just saying, do you know there's an alternative to these boxes that we're giving you? And oh, she I'm was just, disappointed just my funding. amazed. I'm disappointed my taxpayers' money is funding these products. Yeah. So, thinking about yourself, top three things you would do <laughs> for your health. What do you health. got? Okay, so it would be diet activity yep. and I guess just mental well-being and happiness. So t- tell us something about each of those and how... Uh, okay, so f- for diet, we are all, our whole family are all low-carb, whole food. So it's not, you know, we, we don't go for low-carb products, we don't go for keto bars, any of that kind of... It's pretty much, and I always say this, if you go whole food, you almost become low-carb by default. You know, you've got rid of all the sugary drinks, the ultra-processed snacks, all of those things kind of go. So that's how we eat. We eat whole pr- food that is lower in carbs. And how, how old are your kids? Um, they're now 12, 15 and 18. But when we started, um, they would have been seven... I've got to think of the maths now, 7, 10 and 12 or something like right, that. Right, so they were young. you've negotiated adolescence with this. Tell, yeah, tell yeah. us about that. How does that even go? Oh, it's, it's, I think they always know they do the best they can as often as they can and they make as better choices as they can when they're out. So say, for example, if my teenagers go out with their friends, they'll say, oh, you know, mum, what, what would be a good choice? So say if they're going to say Subway, I'll show to them, you know what, if you go to Subway, all your friends are probably going to have a you know, 6, 12-inch sandwich, whatever. They either choose, my kids actually love salads, they either choose a salad of the day instead of a sub of the day, or they will choose like a thin wrap. Or say, for example, if they go to a burger joint, all their friends are having a burger, fries and Coke or whatever, and they know they will have a really thin wrap and they'll have either a Diet Coke or water. So they actually minimise, they have, they still eat out with their friends, but they have better choices, and they're not a huge big deal of their day, you know, they don't... It's not, they're not going out to these kind of places no, all the time. A, 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 but have you had any pushback along the way, like, mum, you're a loser or any of that stuff? No? <laughs> <laughs> I get that on a daily basis anyway. But, <laughs> yeah, but for other reasons. <laughs> yeah, exactly, other reasons. But um, no, I mean, I think given the chance, if, if this ultra-processed food wasn't as damaging to the he- people's health as it was, yes, they would love to go back on that. Everyone would think, you know, these things are very attractive. And they're developed to be that way, that, that, that bliss point that everyone wants. But they know how we're eating 
is for the best of their health in the long run. They know what they're eating. And I give them good nourishing food. They love it. I'll say to them when they come home, what do you want? They go, oh, mum, I just want whatever it is that they're fancying, you know, um, I don't know, a can of tuna. I know that might be bizarre for some people who aren't low-carb, but that's what my kids really like when they come home. Or they'll make themselves like a low-carb mug cake. Uh, is, is it also interesting as they progress through adolescence that they seem to get smarter and smarter? Like, I look at my oldest boy, who's 18 now. Mm. I put some sourdough bread out the other day with the stuff and no one ate it yeah no one was interested yeah uh, and, uh, okay yeah exactly and my kids just have learnt because that's how we all live all the time they know how to make better choices if we go out for a dinner they'll know what to choose you know if they wanted say um i don't know not like i wouldn't have them you know processed burger but if they were at a, a restaurant where it's like a, a proper burger with proper beef kind of thing in there they would know to order it without the chips and have salad instead or whatever they know how to kind of tweak things Food. yeah exactly exactly exercise what do you do I run with a girlfriend three times a week, although sometimes it's just walking because we've had a, a busy day the night before or something. And so that, but when I say run, it's it's more of a sort of, you know, a jog and a chatter and put the world to right when we run around the block. And we honestly, both of us, we say if we weren't there on the street corner waiting for us at 6am, we wouldn't be doing it. You know, you ha we have to have a friend there encouraging us. And what about your vitamin C? Because I, SEA, because I see you setting to sea in boats. Oh, my, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I love my sailing. I do. I have a little boat. It's a little sunburst. It's like a little two-man dinghy that I love sailing, and I absolutely love that. And that, to me, kind of sums up everything I love about being active. It's being fun. It's being in the sun. It's it's mentally challenging. You always have to learn, you know, where's the wind coming from? Are you, are you reaching? Are you, are you running? All that kind of thing. Um, and it's having fun time with my daughter. It's having fun time with my girlfriends. We'll have a laugh and a giggle, and it's just... It's just fun, and I still want to be doing that when I'm sort of 80, even if I'm in my Zimmer frame, kind of hoiking my legs into the boat. That's exactly what I want to do. Do you, do you reckon there's something special about this, what we're calling blue space now? Oh, absolutely. There, there's something about being by the sea. And I, I used to live in, in the UK, and we were near um, Meriden, which is literally the middle of England. You couldn't have got further from the sea if you had tried where we kind of lived. And I missed it. I really did. You know, even just driving past the sea gives you that kind of uplift that you feel. And walking in and having just feeling the sea with you, there's something about it that I think one day they will discover what the sea gives us. Vitamin C. Yeah. And what about this... What was your third? We had the... the oh, what? and just, I think just sort of your, your mental health, being with friends, being with family, doing... And it's, it's, I know a lot of people, sort of my groups, they don't like the word exercise. They hate that because they just think of people in leotards and personal trainers or six-packs kind of thing. And I say exercise is more activity. Being out is being active with your friends. It gives you that mental kind of boost. And just being socialising, it's... You need to look after that. You can't be hibernating all the time. It's oh, so the friend, friends are medicine sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Friends and, yeah, hanging out with friends. And like I say, the sailing kind of encompasses everything. Just giggling the whole way around. <laughs> One of my favourite movies on a kid was The Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> and when the Crocodile Dundee went to New York and they were like, oh, where's so-and-so? Ah, oh, they're with their therapist. And Crocodile Dundee's <laughs> response was, Scrikey, don't they have any mates? Yeah. <laughs> exactly right, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Well, that sounds all sort of pretty perfect. What doesn't, what, what do you reckon you struggle with on health behaviours? I think I've worked on everything slowly as the time goes. You know, I never used to run and I slowly introduced running. You know, I, I, I Googled how to start running and I slowly dressed my diet and food and all of those kind of things. So I kind of slowly went there. But I think, the only th I think the only thing I still struggle with is sometimes the attitudes from other people. That's the and that's, that's what I get from either friends, family, when you're here in media. Um, you know, it was on the news the other day, which we were discussing, that there was a study, of, they were talking about keto on the news, and the guy who was the media presenter was talking about it, and he was saying, oh, that's ridiculous. And he was absolutely poo-pooing. People do that. And I thought, well, don't mock people that want to be healthy and don't mock people who are, you know, like you said before, fitness freaks. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not, it's nothing to be ashamed of. You should be proud of. And if I want to do this, that's my problem. I'm not telling anyone else to do it. If you come to my page, great, I'll help you. But I'm not going out there being an overzealous, telling everyone to do it. So I think just the, the attitude sometimes you get from people. 
What, what do you reckon is going on there, George? Why do people do that? Um, some of it's defence, yeah. It's a mechanism about their own kind of, you know, I think I know I should do this, but mm. I don't really know what to do, and, you know, they're, they're resistant to it. Some of it's a resentment of people who are a little bit holier than thou out there, and some of it, no doubt, they're impressed by some expert like, some sort of blowhard expert like Dr. Katz that's made a good kind of smoke screen of ridicule about something that seems to impress some people. But it runs a bit deep in that, doesn't it? I looked, mm. up, I looked up yesterday, because I'm just interested in ketogenic diets and ketosis, I was reading the Wikipedia entry on ketosis. Well, oh, my Lord. <laughs> Someone's written that <laughs> with an agenda yeah. that, that bears no resemblance to science. Mm. Rewritten it, because it would have been fine you know, a week ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, we're only just becoming aware that really we are in an information war. You know, like the the political war that's the bigger war that's out there. Mm. We're in we're in part of that. We're in a small part of that, and um, we actually have to be aware that media is being manipulated and um, and kind of work out what to do about it because you know it's it's. Um, you don't want to be the conspiracy theorist. You don't want to be the person that, that cries foul because mm. that's, um, it's an overplayed card. So, so bearing that in mind, mm. Libby, what, do you, what would you say? What would be your advice to someone you meet off the street and says, you know, what should I do for my health? What, what would you say, bearing all that in mind? I kind of, well, some friends, it's interesting, when people sort of ask me why I have gone low carb, I already know that they're not ready to go low carb, but if they ask me how I've gone low carb, that's when I know the kind of, that's the difference in the people's attitudes right. are kind of asking me. And I often don't, introduce, you know, when I never introduce myself as what I do, because it's just, that will stop the conversation for the <laughs> next hour, and it's, it's kind of, you know... So I hardly ever do. But if people genuinely ask and they want to know how to either start low carb or just even to go into whole food, you know, it doesn't even need to be as difficult as going low carb. And it just goes start by you know, looking at the worst areas first. The first thing is you drop maybe your sugary sodas. That's the worst area. Can you drop that? And if you can't drop it immediately, can you do it stepwise? And then you think to yourself, well, how can I introduce more whole food into my diet and take the ultra-processed food out? You slowly make little kind of swaps like that and just address each little thing as one at a time. Are there different personalities for that? Do, do different types of people thrive with different strategies like I look at myself yeah. and I go like I'm just I'm either fully doing this <laughs> are, are there those sorts of people yeah, or is that I, just me I think no I think there is and I think again I kind of teach people you either do the stepwise approach where you slowly address either every meal or the worst things in your diet or there are other people who love to do the pantry clear out yeah. and from day one it's quite cathartic and they actually show photos of bin liners of junk food either being thrown away or donated to the local food store, and they love that. And either approach works, you know, and that's what I try and tell people. Don't think that what one person does is impossible for you. Try do whatever works for you in your situation. If it just means you just address maybe your breakfast and you get rid of the granola and the cereals and you go to something different like eggs or leftovers, then start with that and just then improve as you go rather than thinking it's all or nothing just kind of do it little step by step. And I remember talking to a, a mum at Water Polo one night and she was going, oh, you know, I didn't know how to get my kid off the sugary junk and everything out. And I just said, just make one little step. If it's one change every week or one change every month, by the end of the year, you'll have made 12 massive steps or 52 little steps, whatever it is. And she went, oh, my God, I never thought of it like that. She thought she had to go all out. How the heck could she start? And I just said, start reducing it. Uh, that's a good point, isn't it? What you do most of the time also mm. counts, is that... Is that another? Oh, absolutely. You know, some people think, oh, said, oh, you know, low carb doesn't work for them. And then when I question it, they have the odd low carb meal. Well, that doesn't make them low carb. And the vi you know, the converse is true. If they suddenly have a cheat meal, they haven't fallen off the wagon. They've just had a cheat meal. So, um, yeah, it's it's what you do every day on a regular basis that counts. Something I'm really interested in, Libby, is you're talking about. Um, you know, reaching out to lower economic people, people mm. with not a lot of money to mm. spend. And a lot of low-carb meal replacement plans are like you, you give up the cheap granola and then you make your own granola with nuts and things that's going to cost you $100 a, you know, every time you do it. But if you're cooking something like eggs for breakfast instead of granola, you don't need to do that. So I'm really interested in that kind of budget approach to low carb. I hear enough about that because the, the high end approach has more kind of reach, I suppose. And Absolutely, and there are so many low carb replacement 
companies that you know low carb bars low carb proteins all these kind of things and also people really pushing the sort of grass-fed beef and you know the organic and free range and yes that may be the gold standard but if it means you're surviving on burger chips and coke compared to just having some okay can't, it's not free range eggs but just regular eggs that is still a better alternative than staying on the burger and chips or the sugary granola it's I always kind of say do what you can where you are you know if you can only afford the yes the free range will be the gold standard but that is out of the pocket of a lot of people and instead of having organic chicken go for yeah. chicken drumsticks yes. they're as cheap as chips go for the mints go for the fatty um you know we'll, we'll go for the fatty for cuts anyway yeah. but the cheaper cuts of meat yeah. and make a casserole you know we live like kings you make these casseroles and it turns a cheap cut into a luxurious meal and you yeah. you can do these options. Yeah, good, good point with that. So, so if you th- like, what is it? What is a what is a budget low carb day? What could that look like? So it could be okay. You've got to think of this now. Um, maybe some scrambled eggs yep. with maybe some leftovers or even leftovers from the previous night's dinner. I, leftovers are absolute king. I love uh, leftovers. Underrated. Absolutely. The, you know, you cook once, you serve twice. And also, I always say leftovers, it's immediate portion control. You won't go back for another portion because, you know, go, nope, that's lunch of the next day or whatever. Yeah, right. And you can build up a sort of a library of frozen meals in your freezer, you know, at the fraction of a cost of a ready meal. So breakfast could be scrambled eggs. It could be leftovers, anything like that. Lunch could be a salad with leftovers. That's what my husband gets every day. I always say, why get a dog, get a husband? Because he eats all the leftovers <laughs> and all the bits. There'll be like an inch of cheese left. I go, oh, that'll go on his salad and a, two slices of roast pork and that'll go on his lunch. And so it's all those kind, all the dregs from the bottom of the fridge that are still fresh, but that can be a salad. Yep. And then dinner could be, you know, a, a casserole, a, um, a sort of a a curry, which is a slow cooker or an instant mm-hmm. pot with the cheapest cut of meat, gravy yeah. steak, any kind of those, chuck steak, rump steak, any of yeah. those are so frozen cheap. Frozen vegetables. Absolutely. Fro- lot, and those. frozen berries. Everyone yes. thinks, oh, berries are so expensive at the moment. We'll buy frozen. They're a fraction of the cost. Yeah. So, so the preparation for that slow cook thing is pretty quick as well, isn't it? You're just oh, literally chucking things in. Literally. And I, I don't even now, a lot of people, they will pre-fry the meat and they'll pre-fry the onion. No, if you're really in a hurry, you're never going to do it. So I just throw everything in and give it a stir. Um, and even the Instant Pot, which I absolutely love, you can cook, a, like the, you know, it's a pressure cooker, and you can cook a curry in 20 minutes. Both in exercise and diet, when you ask people about their barrier, mm to doing it it's most often a lack of time and when we've because we've studied this quite a lot in our research centre is time use mm. and the astonishing amount of time people spend on screens yep and they don't have time to either move around or cook mm. what do you make of all that I think it's where their priorities are. You know, like you say, people say they don't have time. Well, get off Facebook for a start. Well, they <laughs> might be off, on the carbs. Well, so. they might be. And if that case, then stay there and I can give them some tips. <laughs> but generally, they, you look at the time and it's where they choose to spend that time. You know, is it in front of the TV and, or is it like on social media? Is it um, whatever it is? If, are they gaming? Whatever. I don't know what people's, you know, people spend their time in. But generally you know that they do have time. It's where they choose to spend it. And there's even meals you can prepare that require zero cooking. Like I always say, my go-to meal, if we're really busy and I've come home late from the, with the kids off some sport or something like that, you literally run into the supermarket, you get a rotisserie chicken and a bag of salad. Job done. And yep. all you do, you literally jump the salad on the plates, you're ripping off the chicken. Meanwhile, I'm doing that. Kids are emptying the fridge of all the bits of blue cheese or the bit of mayonnaise or anything they want. And it's almost like their own salad bar and they just throw everything on and it's the quickest easiest meal possible and like you say with prep if you don't want to prep then buy the pre-made cauliflower rice or buy you know your bag of salad buy pre-cooked chicken or whatever it is there are easy ways yeah yeah to do it keto versus low carb and carb restriction in general what do you make of all that and what do you think about all that i think it depends again on the person's situation some people love keto because A, it gives them really good health benefits and mental clarity and everything else. And it takes so many options away. They are quite restricted. So they love that. If that's their kind of, you know, we talked about before about their personality, it's actually really fit for them and they love it. Other people find it far too restrictive. And so then I go, well, go to just moderate low carb or just plain low carb, you know, just do that. And do it to what you can fit in with your daily 
you know, your daily requirements, does that fit in with, you've got to make it sustainable. Oh, that's a really interesting one, isn't it, about the rules? Because George and I earlier were talking about what we call vitamin D. Yeah, I had this, this came to me in a dream. And that was probably <laughs> oh not original. It came to me in a dream, and it was a set up like this, and the podcaster was saying, and you need some vitamin D. Vitamin don't. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your rules of like, just don't do this. You know, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, you know, like, obviously the sugar, sugar sweetened beverages are one, you know, that's mm. an easy one for me. And, um, and um, obviously the things that I'm actually allergic to, you know, that's, a, that's an easy one. So places in, there are places in the rule book for some firm lines, you mm. know, and, and, and that, that can be useful to have in place and just that's not a thing I do. It's like smoking, you know, it's just not a thing I do. Exactly. You know? Yeah, so that, mm. yeah, I, I, for some people, because there is a lot of uh, talk, especially in the dietitian community, and I debated a couple just last week, about moderation and enjoying all foods. And I found that is sort of the opposite of the vitamin D rule, mm. which is have no real rule, just do whatever makes you feel good, and that will work out. And I, what, what do you make of that? I think this everything in moderation. I, a, I think that's been invented by the food manufacturers. You know, you can have a little bit of mm. this and a little bit of that, and basically having a little bit of all different types of junk food all day long, kind of thing. And what does moderation mean? You know, for me, yeah. that might mean something completely different to somebody else. If I'm moderate, say, in low carb, that might be extremely widely different to say somebody who's extremely hardcore keto or a carnivore you know what is moderation mm. and really do we want our health in moderation I don't <laughs> you know I don't so I want to do the best I can as often as I can so I'm not having junk food and I'm not going to have ultra processed food and yeah it's it's I mean I think there are areas where moderation has been defined so alcohol consumption there is a defined you know moderate is a, is a defined thing one to and two think, servings and a, and a glass is one of those little small glasses that no one drinks out of <laughs> yeah, and, and I think another area um, is if, if you look at, you know, things that are actually toxic, like oxalates in mm -hmm. foods, you know, to, to look at consumption of those as something that you want to be, you don't want to be immoderate. You don't want loading up smoothies with spinach all the time because that can have adverse effects on your kidneys. So, you know, you know, there's a few areas where it kind of does make sense. But as an overall plan to apply to everything that you're offered, it makes no sense to me. And no. And, and I think there are some, there's some epidemiology where they've asked at least Americans to report their eating style and those who reported themselves as moderators were in the worst condition of the lot. Yeah. <laughs> for what thought that's worth. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it's I mean, a vague concept in the first place. Yeah. And if people think I'm being restrictive, well, I'm only restricting myself to whole food. What do you say to people out there who aren't even started on the journey though? Like, they find out you do this low carb thing. They're like, "What is that? What are you on about? What is there a?" Because because these are the, this is I've the had this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've had people. You know, I'm 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 on this kind of challenge at the moment. Where I'm actually alcohol free this entire year, which is for somebody who loves the red wine and champagne. It's it's completely off off the wall for me. But I'm doing it. And um, someone said to me, "Oh, for goodness sake, what's left?" And it's like, well, for me, actually, I'm. It was this. It's kind of like this negative again. What we said about you know people being quite m mockering or some from some kind of place of defence. Well, a lot of people, food and drink and everything else, that is their hobby. That literally is their hobby. And it's like, well, I have other things in my life other than food and drink. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's, right. it's like, yeah, yeah. And so I do get this kind of kickback from a lot of people who say, oh, for goodness sake, what do you eat for good? And it's all this, it almost starts with this for goodness sake kind of. And it's like, well, I don't mock anybody. I don't go up to anybody and tell them. I don't preach it. But if people ask, absolutely, I will help them. But then don't be negative. If I'm actually looking after my health yeah. as best I can. Uh, so so you, this is, you started at the start of the year with the alcohol-free thing? Yeah, yeah. I just did a little mini-day challenge with, with my membership. And then we did a little three-day challenge. And I did a three-day challenge. I thought, right, January 1st, I'll see if I can go without alcohol. And so I did three days. And we were away on holiday. So I'm amazed. You were going out fishing every day. And of course, when you come home from fishing, what do you want? You want a glass of wine. And um, I thought, no, no, I'll see if I can do it. And I thought, no, actually, I felt really, really fabulous with not drinking. And then I thought, I'll just see if I can f do the week, because it was a weekend holiday, is near and impossible, you know, you want to drink and, you know, sit out on the deck in the sun. And then I thought, I'll just see if I can do it for January. I didn't want to set myself any big goals. And then I just, as the time went on, I just felt so fabulous. 
I just thought, actually, I'm going to set myself a goal for 2019, other than two dates, on my 50th birthday and my daughter's 18th. They're my two caveats. Yeah, right. And, um, and it's not going to be no forever. I just want to see, can I do it for a whole year? And it's also been, like I say, when I tell people, and I don't go out there advertising it, I'll just say, oh, no, thanks, I'm, I'd, I'd just like a, you know, I don't know, whatever, soda water or whatever. Um, it's there, again, the attitude's kind of back. It's like, I'm not telling you to do this. I'm not telling anyone to do it. It's just what I have chosen. Oh, it's interesting, because I've just started a, a three-month alcohol thing. I haven't really told anyone about it. Mm. I'm a week and a half into it. Frankly, I've actually found the first week and a half quite hard. Because <laughs> uh, uh, I don't really drink wine, but I'd, I've, I'd started, for some reason, drinking these low-carb beers, and, then, and they're quite nice. Yeah. And then I started drinking them every day. <laughs> and so you come home from work, and you'd have beer. And it's a habit. It's a habit. Yeah, it but really it's the, is. It's the cues that get me still. Yeah. So you, you and, and I'm on a little challenge at the moment with some other guys, and we've been doing this for a week and a half. Mm. And you know, on Saturday we got a in the close face, you know, from one of the guys, comrades. I've fallen, you know. <laughs> 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 um, but. Yeah, I've, I've definitely got more mental clarity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know so many people who have gone alcohol-free and they've just found... And again, it's completely, completely optional to anyone in their position, but they've gone alcohol-free. And even one guy, the, the guys that I go sailing with, I think I'm the youngest on the boat by sort of, you know, quite a few decades. And even one of them, we went to a Christmas party and there he was, this old sea dog, drinking his kombucha instead of his alcohol. And he goes, I've never felt so good. And all, what was lovely, all the guys were around him going, oh, good on you, mate. And they were really positive about what he'd done because he was on this kind of health challenge for himself. And he said he's never felt so good when he didn't drink it. And he's going to go back to moderation. And like you say, there is a limit for moderation for alcohol. So he's going to go back to one or two drinks. But he just felt that they were creeping up beyond what he was happy with. So what do you make of this whole... Challenge, mini challenges, bigger challenges thing. I like mini challenges, but I think people need to go into them thinking they're not a sort of um, some kind of weird kind of wacky kind of um, gimmicky thing. I like challenges, just you're sort of laser focused for those three days or week or whatever it is. And it's easier to say no, to go, actually, I'm on a mini challenge rather than going, oh, well, actually, I should cut back on my wine. No, yeah. I'm on a challenge or I should cut back on my coffee or whatever it is. And I, th I think doing it from the point of view of not do this because you should, but do this and see what happens. Do this yeah. and pay attention to the process mm. of doing it, how it affects you. Um, and, you, you know, how hard is it? Why is it hard? How does it make you feel? Um, is, is and it may be that people at the end may go, OK, well, whatever, it was, whatever their poison was that they've cut out for three days or a month or whatever, maybe at the end they might think, man, I felt so much better, I'm not actually going to go back. Or, you know what, at least it's managed to make you cut down or address whatever it was, whatever that may be that you actually think, you know what, I'm not going to go back to where I was. I'm just going to, you know, cut it back to a level that I'm happy with. Because there's quite a lot of criticism about these sorts of things from the public health community in particular, right? So, they, like, like, you're serious, like, this dry July is a classic mm. example. You, you'd have... You know, Sugar-free September. Oh, yeah, right, OK. So, yeah, there you go. So, both of those. And, and I've always wondered exactly why there was so much criticism. Yeah, I, I don't understand it. I don't know, is it, like you said, but is it something from... You know, are they afraid or is it their kind of... Are they feeling that it's something that they're not addressing? I don't know what what the backlash is because, to me, I kind of think live and let live and if that's working for you, great, go for it. But if it doesn't work for someone else, then do what works for you. I, I think there's an, an analogy here with kind of the bigger picture of um, cutting the carbs. Some people go low-carb and they don't want to be low-carb and they're going to eat carbs again. But if they do really give low-carb a try, they'll know a lot more about the carbohydrates they're eating. Mm -hmm. They will be making better choices. Yeah. And it will suddenly, when they start to look and see what they're eating, go, man, I never knew that my chai latte had 20 grams of sugar in there when they make it. Or they never knew their skinny latte or their Weight Watchers um, sweet and sour low-fat chicken had whatever... This, it just opens yeah, the yeah, eyes yeah. to looking at labels. And they may go back to a, a very high-carb diet, but it will, probably won't be flour and it probably won't be sugar. Exactly. Yeah, but, the, the, mm. the, to counter that, though, the public health argument is like the food environment's pathological, it's full of sugary drinks, needs to be regulated. Mm. But they're not, it's, not, it's not an either-or thing, is it? We agree with that. Mm. So the fact that our leading cause of hospitalisation in our children is getting anaesthetised to get dental caries fixed... And that's our number one cost for kids as well. No one 
says that kids should go on a three-day sugar-free trial and that's going to fix the problem. We know that we've got to fix the whole food supply, mm. but that shouldn't preclude us from getting started individually exactly. as well. Yeah. Exactly. Right, well, Libby, thank you so much. We appreciate it yeah. being on My Flipping Health. My absolute pleasure. And that's it. Thanks for listening to the Flippin' Health podcast. Next episode, we'll be talking with Dr. Glenn Davies, General Practitioner Physician from Taupo, New Zealand. Here's a man on a mission to reverse diabetes for a whole town. You will love what he's got to say and what he's done. This podcast is brought to you by Precure. Prevention is cure. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and subscribe. If you know someone who could benefit, please share it with them. Together, we can change medicine for the better. Change medicine for good.